shouldn't be giving a talk because uh, it's kind of my little talks program, but I am doing it. Um, so I thought about what I would talk about. I'm Ben Street. I've been working with Carl on Sluice uh, for the last five years and working with Stephanie and Paul in uh, exchange rates. This is our second year. I'm an art historian, writer, and lecturer in London. I'm not an artist. And I work between collections of old master painting and of contemporary art. So I work for the National Gallery as a lecturer, but I also work for Tate and for other institutions as well. So I'm always fascinated by moments when the present and the past of art touch. And an artist that I've been interested in for a very long time um, is Philip Guston. And he's an artist I bet a lot of people are very familiar with, and it might be a painting that's very familiar too, but it's something that's become, I think, more important to me recently. But let me just tell you about the work that I've chosen, first of all, uh, and a little bit about Guston. This is a painting called Pantheon from 1973. It's in a private collection upstate in Woodstock, which is where Guston painted. Guston was a very well-regarded abstract expressionist painter who famously had a sudden turn in the late 1960s and turned his back on abstraction and moved back to what he'd started with, which was a kind of figuration. But when the figure returns in Guston's paintings at the end of his life, it comes back as a kind of nightmarish cartoon coming partly out of Crazy Cat and partly out of early Renaissance painters like Paolo Uccello. Um, his work was extremely controversial. This is a painting he made um, just after the controversy of this last period of paintings had really hit New York after his Marlboro Gallery show in 1970. He spent about 18 months in Rome. When he came back from Rome, he made this painting, Pantheon. And Pantheon is a pantheon. And a pantheon is a group of heroes, in a sense, the Greek or Roman pantheon of gods. This is Guston's pantheon of gods. It's a pantheon of Italian artists whose names are written or painted onto the surface of the canvas itself. They are artists that start maybe with Giotto. We have Giotto, this is in historical order. Giotto, Masaccio, Piero for Piero della Francesca, Tiepolo for uh, Giambattista Tiepolo, and finally De Chirico for Giorgio De Chirico, Italian artists starting in the 14th and ending in the 20th century, Guston's favourite artists painted on the surface of the canvas. And also on the canvas are two objects that are related to the practice of being a painter. The names have to do with um, inspiration and ideas, I suppose, and we also have a cartoonish version of two objects that were associated for Guston with the practice of being in a studio. One is a light bulb hanging down, and the other one is an easel with a blank canvas on it. So it relates to the daily practice of being an artist. Now, the painting itself is really fascinating, partly because it's not obviously indebted to any of those artists. When you read the names of the artists and you see the style of the painting, those seem to be slightly at odds with each other. What Guston found in the art of the early Renaissance, people like Piero or Giotto, was a kind of awkwardness, kind of clumsiness, and a heaviness about the way objects and people were represented. There's a kind of strange modernness to somebody like Giotto. He's often presented, I was an art history teacher for a long time, and Giotto is very often the starting point for talking about the Renaissance. But when you look at Guston, and then you look at Giotto, he doesn't look like the starting point, he looks like the pinnacle. He looks like it can't get any better than that. And that's the way that an artist can change the way we see the art of the past. Now, the reason why this has been important to me recently, this painting, I mean, Guston has been important to me as a figure for a very long time. Um, my, one of my favourite books about art is uh, the biography written by his daughter, which is called Night Studio, which is an amazing book to read. But it's also been important to me because of uh, David Bowie. So I wanted to talk about Guston, but I also wanted to talk about Bowie, who's much more important, as far as I'm concerned, much more important artist than Guston. 
um, even though Augustine's very, very important. There's a great article, essay that I was reading in Freeze magazine by Dan Fox. And it's a, a, an essay called Hang On To Yourself, David Bowie as Art School. Uh, it's a brilliant essay. Um, it's available online. And it's about how Bowie, through his music and through sleeve notes and through his interviews and through his presence, became a conduit for lots of aspects of culture that wouldn't perhaps otherwise have been accessed by the people listening to his music. So if you listen to Hunky Dory alone, just that album, uh, which came out um, a little bit before this painting was made, you have references to Nietzsche and to uh, Brecht and to all manner of different cultural figures that you might otherwise have discovered. If you listen to his music, you discover Chris Burden, or you might discover um, you know, any number of writers and thinkers of the past. Bowie was a kind of enthusiast, an amateur in the true sense of the word. That's why I mention him in relation to this painting, because Guston was in a way the same. Guston was a kind of one-man art school, and I'm interested in that because I work in museum and gallery education. There is a body of knowledge which exists as text, which is called art history, which is slightly separate from the practice of being an artist. It's not usually done by artists. It's usually done by people like me who aren't artists, people who are writers or scholars. But there is an art history that exists already within artistic practice. I've often thought one of the best kind of responses to Las Meninas by Velázquez is by Picasso. There's that room of paintings in the Picasso Museum in Barcelona, which is in a way more eloquent about what Velázquez is about and what Picasso is about than any number of essays you could read about the subject. So back to Guston for a second. This is 1973, which Bowie fans will know was the year that uh, Lad Insane came out. So uh, the one after Ziggy Stardust, which if you haven't got, you've got to get it. Am I going over my time? I'm not, believe it or not. <laughs> came out the same year as Lad Insane. Um, uh, why did I mention that? Because Guston is showing you this pantheon, this kind of list, like a shopping list of great Italian artists, but because he's doing it within this style, within this slightly willfully ham-fisted or willfully awkward style, we are experiencing those artists' works through Guston's own language which is the same way that I think we might experience the culture that Bowie talked about in his music. We experience Andy Warhol through the song Andy Warhol by David Bowie, which is how I came to be interested in Andy Warhol. That was a, my kind of conduit. Song for Bob Dylan was the way I got into Bob Dylan. So these are kind of the roots in which culture happens. I guess what I'm talking about really is an alternative form of art history that doesn't exist outside of but exists somehow within the practice of art itself. If you were to look at the work of the artists that are on the list, that's what they do too. Masaccio, in the 1420s, looks back to classical art, and brings it in, changes the way space is created and thought of within a painting. He's interpreting the past for you, bringing it back into focus, just the same way that Guston does. Talk using Guston maybe was a bit of a cliche, I don't know. Some people might think, to roll their eyes and think, Guston's been done. Because Guston's very, very, very prevalent, of course. When Guston's uh, late work was shown, the most famous criticism of it was by Hilton Kramer, probably. It already always comes up in relation to the late work. Where Hilton Kramer, the art critic, said that Guston's late work were the works of a mandarin posing as a stumble bum, which is a brilliant line, but a mandarin, somebody who's a kind of brilliant, uh, kind of natural, maker of this shimmering, delicate, impressionistic abstract painting, posing as a stumble bum, pretending to be a fool, pretending to be a jester. What happens, though, is that history was not on Hilton Kramer's side. And Guston's work not only has been immensely important for artistic practice since his death in 1980, but it's also been, for, and this is where it comes into focus for me, really important to the way that we understand the history of painting the way that we think about what came before, the way that the pantheon illuminates the past as well as the present. That is, I think, pretty much 10 minutes.